Hello everyone. So I'm back. And uh, we just finished uh, two problems of decision science, actually, of two this of a single decision decision maker in each one of the examples. But now we want to move to games. And what is the difference? Let me just uh, emphasize that. A, a game is uh, where you have multiple decision makers. Everyone uh, chooses his or her strategy. And uh, my strategy will affect your outcome. And your strategy is going to affect my outcome. And therefore, when I take a strategy, I have to take into account how you're going to react to mine and how you are going to uh, and how you are going to react to mine and how I'm going to react to your reaction and how you are going to react to my reaction to your first step etc cetera, etc cetera. it's like chess that's why game theory is called chess because uh, the, uh, that's why sorry uh, the it's called game game theory because the first article by Zermelo, 1912, uh, was on chess. So uh, we start, so let's uh, by the way, until now, uh, we, I mean, there are like 10 to 11 Nobel Prize winners. All of them got the Nobel Prize in uh, economics, and, uh, but for doing game theory and applications of game theory. Okay. So let me uh, start not by the example I gave you like chess, where we move sequentially. First me, then you, then me, then you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's uh, start with a game where we take decisions simultaneously. So from now on until I tell you, until we get to dynamic games, we are talking about simultaneous games. By the way, even with that, in uh, one or two examples, I'll show you what's going on and what's the difference when we play this game sequentially. But let's start. So I want to start with the notion of dominant and dominated strategies. So um, let's start with a, a, a very simple example. There is a couple, Alice and Bob, and then unfortunately decide to divorce. And unfortunately, but not for the lawyers, for themselves. Their total asset is $500,000. They need to reach an agreement of how to divide that $500,000. Each one of them has two choices. I take this example as, a, as just an example to hire the first choice to hire a brilliant lawyer that is very costly, who charges for his work $150,000, or to hire an ordinary, a regular lawyer who charges a fee of just $50,000, one third of the brilliant one. If both of them hire the same type of lawyer, they, uh, they, none of them has any advantage on the other, and therefore the assumption is that they will split the asset equally. So if I <coughs> take ordinary lawyer and you take ordinary lawyer, I'll get 250, you get 250, and each one of us will pay the lawyer 50, we'll end up with $200,000. If both of us take the brilliant lawyer, still I don't have any advantage over you and same for you. So again, we split, that's the assumption, 250, 250. But now we have to pay 150 each to his or her lawyer. And therefore each one of us end up with just $100,000. So if I just compare these two possibilities, both of us take an uh, ordinary uh, lawyer, or both of us take the brilliant lawyer, it's better for us to take the ordinary because we are going to end up with $200,000 net instead of a net of $100,000. Okay. Remember, we play the game simultaneously. I don't know what you do. 
You don't know what I do with true simultaneous. Okay, now what happens if one of them take the brilliant and the other one takes the, the ordinary? Let's, uh, let's see what happens. So if both of them hire the same type of lawyer, they will split the asset equally, but, but namely each will receive 250. However, if I take the brilliant lawyer and you take the ordinary lawyer, that's why mine is a brilliant one. I'm assuming that out of the 500,000, I'll get $375,000 and you will end up with 125,000. But now we have to pay the lawyer. <clears throat> Out of the 375, I will have to pay my lawyer 150. I'll end up with 225. You will have to pay 50. So you have to subtract 50 from the what you get, 125. You end up with a net 75. So uh, that's the, this is the situation now. If you take brilliant and I take uh, ordinary lawyers, then uh, exactly the same. You get 375 and you have to pay 150 from that. And I have to, I'm, I will get only 125 and I'll have to pay my lawyer 50. That's, this is the situation. In any event, the two lawyers end up, no matter what we do, um, um, I mean, each lawyer obtains his fee, or which is either 150 for the brilliant or 50 for the ordinary. Okay. So what happens with this game? Should I uh, should I hire ordinary lawyer? Should I hire brilliant lawyer? You should have the same problem. Now we don't talk to each other. We sit at some in. I sit in one place. You sit in the different place and we have to take a decision. Let's see how to analyze it. So uh, the situation can be described by the following table. So this is Alice, she's the first player. This is Alice, she is the first player and she has two choices to go for a brilliant lawyer or to go for ordinary lawyer. This is Bob, who can also ch choose a brilliant or an ordinary lawyer. What happens? If both of us choose the brilliant, we, we split equally. So each one of us get 250 and we have to pay 150. We end up with 100 each. So this, the blue one, uh, is the payoff to player one, Alice. And the red one is the payoff for Bob. So Alice gets 100 and Bob got, gets 100. Now suppose that Alice takes a brilliant lawyer and Bob takes an ordinary lawyer. What happens? So actually Alice gets the brilliant versus the ordinary, 375 she gets. She has to pay 150, so she end up with 225. And what happened to Bob, who chose the ordinary? He gets only 125. He subtract from that the fee of the ordinary lawyer, which is 50, and he gets 75. So 225 and 75. 225 to Alice, 75 to Bob. Completely opposite if Alice go for the ordinary and Bob goes for the brilliant. So now Alice will get the 75 and Bob will get 225, exactly as it's here, but opposite. And what happens if both of them goes for the ordinary? They split 250 each, paying 50 each, end up with 200. So this is the situation. Now after my mass, I am going to erase everything. Very nice. I like, okay. I leave it like this for a second if you want to look. And now I'm looking at what will happen as a 
result of this table. So this is, we describe the game in a table where Alice is the role player, if you like. She chooses B or ordinary, brilliant or ordinary, meaning she chooses row, the up row or the down row. Bob is the column player. He can choose brilliant, which is this column, or can choose ordinary, meaning that column. When Alice chooses a row and Bob chooses a column, the result, the, then we have the outcome. Let's say that Alice chooses this and Bob chooses this, the outcome will be this. So as a result of the strategy choice by the two players, the outcome is derived uniquely. Okay, so now let's check what's going on. So I claim that Alice should choose the brilliant one. Why? Let's compare. So I say that she should choose brilliant. She doesn't know what Bob chooses. If Bob chooses B, brilliant, then she gets 100. And if she would go to ordinary, she will go, she will get only 75. So if Alice believes that Bob go for a brilliant one, she should go for brilliant, not for the ordinary, because 100 is more than 75. And if Alice believed that Bob is going to hire the ordinary lawyer, again, she should choose the brilliant. Why? Because 225 is more than 200. If she chooses the ordinary, she's going to get 200. If she chooses uh, the brilliant, she's going to get 225. So she can guarantee by going for the brilliant to get 25, look on the difference, 25, 25. She guarantees to get 25 more than if she chooses the ordinary. That is, we call that a dominant strategy. And sometimes we call it strictly dominant strategy. And uh, so uh, why it is, we describe no matter what Alice, uh, what Bob is doing, 100 is more than 75, 225 is more than 200, and therefore she must go on a brilliant lawyer. This is, B is strictly dominant strategy, or if you like, B strictly dominates O, because no matter what Bob does, with B, Alice is going to get more than with, order, with O, with the ordinary one. Okay, what about Bob? Bob also doesn't know what Alice will do, but he says, he compares, should I go here or should I go here? Well, he says to himself, if Alice is going to go brilliant, then if I go brilliant, I get 100. If I go ordinary, I get, I'm getting 75. So if I believe that Alice is going to choose the brilliant lawyer, I should choose the brilliant lawyer as well, because I'm getting 25 more. And if Alice is going to choose the ordinary, then for sure I have to go to the brilliant. Why? Because then I get 225, and if I go to the ordinary, I'll get only 200. So Bob compares this to this, and this to this. And since 100 is more than 75 and 225 is more than 200, Bob is going to go for the ordinary as well. Let me take now this out. So Bob is going to go uh, to the brilliant as well. So uh, what we see here is that uh, the outcome is 100 to Bob, 100 to Bob, 100 to, to Alice. And this is really an inferior outcome. Why it is inferior? There is another outcome, better for both of them. But somehow, if they, pay, they play the game simultaneously as we saw here, 
They cannot avoid being here. This is the only rational outcome. This is a better outcome for them, but they cannot reach it. This is like if they sign a contract that both of them commit, otherwise they will get a big penalty to go for an ordinary lawyer. Uh, then, so this I would call the cooperative outcome. Cooperative outcome. But you can never, unless you have binding agreement where you can sign a contract between Alice and Bob that both of them choose uh, the ordinary lawyer, if you're allowed to do things like this, then this is the outcome. But otherwise, if you have no binding agreements, we can agree, we can talk, but we do whatever we want after all. Nobody can give me a penalty by going to that lawyer or to that lawyer. In that case, the only outcome, only rational outcome is this. Why? Because B is strictly dominates O, and again, B is strictly o dominates O, and therefore Alice is going to play here, and Bob is going to play here, and this is the only outcome. Unfortunately, an inferior outcome. What does it mean inferior? To both of them. Both of them could, there is an outcome which is better for both of them. 200 bigger than 100, 200 bigger than 100. And therefore, that's what we get. Let me, in the next slide, we will uh, we'll see this. Uh, I have here an expert. If I go, if I move, do I erase, if I move on, do it stays or it will be erased if I don't do anything? Will stay. Will, ah, will stay, so, okay, in any way. Okay. But when you exit, you don't save the reads. The ah, okay, if I exit, it's fine. Okay, thank you, see you. She helps me a lot. I'm a lost case without her. See you, Ma. Dr. See you, Ma. She finished her PhD under my supervision. Okay, and she's great. Okay, I'm lucky. So what is this? No matter what Bob decides to do, Alice is best off hiring a brilliant lawyer. Similarly, no matter what Alice does, Bob is best off also hiring a brilliant lawyer. If he, I mean, if Bob will not hire brilliant lawyer, he is going to get $25 less. It doesn't matter what she does. 100 is more than 75 by 25. 225 is more than 200 by 25. Okay, so as you can see, this is the only outcome. And then the question is, and here's the question. So first, the only rational outcome is that both Alice and Bob hire brilliant lawyers and net $100,000 $100, each. Who makes the most of it? The lawyers, as usual. So uh, my recommendation to you, if you, have, uh, if you think that you may divorce, be a lawyer. Uh, so that, this is uh, an example where both players have strictly dominant strategy. And if you have a strictly dominant strategy, you have to choose it. Otherwise, you'll get for sure less. What does it mean, a, strict, a strictly dominant strategy? It's a strategy which is better than any other strategy, no matter what the, the other player is doing. So you have a strategy that kills all, uh, all your other strategies in, in the sense that no matter what the other player is doing, with that strategy you get more, strictly more. So for sure you have to choose it. If you don't choose it, you choose something less, for sure you'll get something less. Okay. By the way, this example is actually a, another, it's a version of what we call the prisoner's dilemma, the, the prisoner's dilemma game. And we'll talk about it. Okay. So, uh, uh, you can, I, uh, here is another example, but with the same, because you can say, well, why should they hire uh, brilliant or ordinary? They should do without lawyer. So that example, the next example 
is an example where they choose no lawyer, a may choose no lawyer. Let's, let's look on it. Now let's assume each, that both are, let's, now let's assume that both Alice and, uh, and Bob have the option to negotiate without a lawyer. The each is redundant. Now let's assume, I don't know, here I take it up. Uh, I mess. Here I want to erase this one. Up, I cannot because I see that. Which one? I'll go go here. I want to erase the each. We'll do it later. That's okay. Now let's assume that both Alice and Bob have the option to negotiate without a lawyer. Assumptions. When one side is represented by a brilliant lawyer and the other side is not represented by a lawyer, the lawyer who gets, uh, the, the lawyer will get for his client 420 and leave the other side only with 80. Because the other side doesn't take any lawyer, doesn't understand, he or she do not understand the game well. The brilliant lawyer will take most of it, 420 out of the 500, leaving to the other partner 80. That's not enough. I have to tell you what happens when a brilliant, when, a, when an ordinary play against no lawyer. When one side is represented by an average lawyer, average, I mean here, ordinary, yes? Maybe I should change this also lawyer and the other side is not represented by a lawyer, then I'm assuming, it's not necessarily, this is an example, I'm assuming that the ordinary lawyer will get 315, leaving 185 to the party that decide to go with no lawyer. Okay? <clears throat> However, if the one that is represented, it does not represent it by a lawyer and gets 185, doesn't pay any fee, so that's net. This guy, 315, but has to pay, remember, the $50,000. So he will net 265. This one, for instance, you get, your client is getting 420, but uh, they have to subtract the 150. So that is 270,000 net. So if you believe me, you can check it uh, very, uh, uh, very thoroughly. So first of all, look, average should be ordinary, okay? It doesn't matter. Average lawyer versus brilliant, it's like before, 225 and 75. So this is like before. Average, with an average, 200 each, like before. Now, brilliant and brilliant, 100, 100 as before. Brilliant over the average is like before. So these four squares is exactly like before because we exclude the possibility of no lawyer. But what happens if there's no lawyer? Let's say you go with no lawyer, I'm going with the brilliant. Remember 420, you, I mean, player two, that's Bob, hire the brilliant, he gets 420, has to pay 150, net 270. And the other one, uh, player one, Alice, she doesn't go with the lawyer, she gets 80, 80 is net, okay? Opposite if Alice goes to a brilliant and Bob goes to a no lawyer, so now Alice getting the 270 and Bob gets 80. So we left with, now if both of them don't go to any lawyer, they get 250, 250, they split equally and they don't need to, pay any fee. So, uh, and the, the last one to see, what happens, no lawyer, uh, average lawyer and no lawyer, remember the average lawyer was taking 315, leaving 185 to the other. So the, under, the 185 for the no lawyer is net, but the 315 you have to subtract, it's here. You have to subtract the 50, you get 265, leaving a 185, and if, uh, if Bob, player two, is choosing average, while Alice chooses no lawyer, 
they get exactly opposite to this. So actually what you see here is, uh, the, uh, is the game now with three strategies each. So the strategy of one, which was Alice, and uh, then you have three strategies, each one of the rows, if you like. So this is the row player and two is the column player. If uh, one chooses a row, let's say chooses no lawyer, and let's say that two chooses the column average, we'll go here and here, and this will be the outcome. The outcome is the intersection of the row chosen by one and the column, column chosen by two. Okay? And now let me see if I can erase the way that uh, that CU, just a second, put like this, no. CU taught me, I have to study it together with you so you know how incompetent I am. Okay, so I think that you now understand how incompetent I am, but here is the game. Now, as we look on this game, again, this is again the dominant strategy of each one of them is to choose the brilliant lawyer. Why? I don't know what two will do. I'm player one. If I choose, I have to, uh, to go for the... If I choose that one, uh, if I'm player one and I choose the brilliant lawyer, I don't know what you do. If you go for brilliant, I'll get 100. But if I go, I choose average and... Let's say I, I believe that you choose the brilliant lawyer, okay? Then I have to compare, what should I do? 100, 75, or 80? I should go for the 100. Namely, if I believe you go for the brilliant, I should go for the brilliant. If I believe that you go to the average lawyer, then again I should go to the brilliant. Why? Because this is more than this, more than this. So again, this is the best. What happens here? If I think that you are going no lawyer, I have to compare this to this to this. Again, this is the best. So this is a dominant strategy to go for a brilliant lawyer. Why? Because no matter what player two does, I'll get more than <clears throat> if I go for any other alternative, average lawyer or no lawyer. So again, this is the only rational outcome. The same for player two, also the why for player two. Let's do it again, just to make sure that we understand it. So uh, let me erase all this. Oh, it's brilliant. Okay. What about player two? She doesn't know what one does. She says, suppose one go to brilliant. Should I go to brilliant? Should I go to average? If she goes to average, she gets 75. Or should I go to no lawyer to get 80? 100 is the best. So if she believes that one go to brilliant, she has to go to the brilliant. What happens if she believes that one go for average? She says 225 versus 285. Again, in this case, brilliant. What happens if the other one they, takes no lawyer? Should I go brilliant to get 270 or go average to get 265 or go no, no lawyer to get 250? This is again the best. So in all three cases, I should go for a brilliant lawyer. And therefore, my dominant strategy for player two is also brilliant lawyer. So in that case, what we get is that um, uh, both of them choose the brilliant lawyer and 100, 100 is the only outcome. Compare it to 250, 250. If they don't take, no, if they don't take lawyers, it's really pity, but you cannot avoid it. So actually, as you can see, I mean, it's inf again inferior. Not only inferior to the 250, 250, but also 200, 200. And even it's inferior to 264, 185. In all these cases, both of them could get more, okay? But still, tough luck, 100 and 100. And you can't, let's say, I, I want to, just to illustrate something. Suppose that we understand it. I am uh, Alice, you are Bob. I come to you and say, look, Bob, 
the best for us is 250, 250, let's not take a lawyer. Okay, we shake hands, no binding agreement, that's the assumption. We cannot sign a contract that, uh, uh, that bind me, okay? That, uh, that if I renege on that contract, I have to pay a huge penalty. That's the assumption. And it's important assumption for non-cooperative games. We'll talk about it later. Firms not only could not even cooperate or coordinate on, uh, on prices and stuff, but even if you can talk, you cannot write anything down. I mean, write down in terms of contract. Okay, that's the assumption. No binding agreements. Okay, so I come to you. I'm player one, I'm Alice. I come to you, player two, and say, look, I like this outcome. Let's not take a lawyer. And I, I hope that you do it. But if you do it, the best for me is not I mean, not to fulfill the, our agreement because I should go here to get to 70. I hope that we, you go here, that you believe me and don't take lawyer. But I'm not, there's no binding agreement and forget about ethics here. We're talking business. So even though we, we like to get this one, but if there are no binding agreements, uh, and it doesn't matter, even if you cheat me, okay? And uh, let's say we agree to go for no lawyer, and all of a sudden you cheat me and you go to average lawyer. Again, I'm best off with the brilliant. So no matter what, I'm always best off with the brilliant. So no matter how we make an agreement, no binding agreement, but just by talking, chip talk, we decide to go to do something, no lawyer and no lawyer, for sure I'm going to choose the brilliant lawyer. Hopefully, I hope that you stick to the agreement you choose no lawyer, in which case, instead of 100, 100, I'm going to 100 for me, I'm going to get 270 if you uh, go for no lawyer. In any event, you can't, that is the only rational outcome of the game, unfortunately. It's look a little bit uh, disappointing, but that's life. Life not always full of roses. It may be very disappointing, like here. Okay, again, the dominant study of each one of them is to choose the brilliant lawyer, and therefore, you get an inferior outcome. Again, what do I mean by inferior outcome? Is an outcome where you can find other outcomes, or at least, at least one of them that is better for both of them, like 250, 250, or 200, 200, or 265, 185, okay. I hope we got the point. And, uh, and now, uh, in this case, uh, we can move on to the original prisoner's dilemma game. So in 1950, Melvin Drescher and Meryl Flood, or Flood, I don't know, Flood probably, from the Rent Corporation, was very famous at that time. The, the, the giant person in game theory by the name of uh, Lloyd Chapley, we'll mention him later on. He got the Nobel Prize in 2012 uh, <clears throat> and died a few years, few years later. Um, also was, I mean, uh, did all of, most of his work to, with the Rent Corporation, then he moved to UC, UCLA. But in 1950, I mean, both of them formulate a, a game that is it's called the Prisoner's Dilemma game. And actually the name for that game was given by Albert Tucker. Uh, Tucker worked a little, I mean, a lot of things he did with uh, um, Kuhn. A lot of Kuhn-Tucker conditions, both uh, those of you that uh, did anything on uh, applied mathematics, uh, or inequality or some maximization under all kinds of constraints. Remember the Kuhn Tucker, both of them, Kuhn and Tucker, both of them from Princeton. I think that Kuhn is still alive, probably very, very old, close to 100 or whatever. And um, Tucker died. And by the way, the son of Tucker retired and still. Uh, is in Stony Brook University for, for many, many years. Alan Tucker, 
אוקיי? From applied mathematics, אוקיי. So Tucker called this game Prisoner's Dilemma, and Tucker came up with the following story which motivated an equivalent version of Drescher and Flood, and it's equivalent to the one, or very similar to the one I told you about the, the couple that has to split an asset for divorce. Okay, so here is it. Two suspects, that's the original story, two suspects in a major crime, murder, or I don't know, something, uh, or, um, or something severe, are held in custody. There is enough evidence to convict each of them of a minor offense, like holding a gun with no license, but not enough evidence to convict either of them on a major crime. Namely, if they're both silent, you can't do nothing. Unless one of them act as an informer against the other, okay, I testify against you. If they both stay quiet, each will be convicted of the minor offense and spend only one year in prison. So here is the situation in a table. If one and only one of them admits he will be freed and used as a witness against the other, who will spend life in prison. If both of them are good guys and they admit their crime, they will get 15 years in prison. So let's analyze the situation here. Look, if I admit and you admit each 15 years in prison, if I admit and serve as an informer and testify against you, you are going to spend life in prison, but I'm going to be free. Free and no, uh, no criminal record, which is very, very important. I can start my new life happy and free. no problem. If I'm quiet and you admit, okay, you admit and testify against me, I'm going to life in prison and you are going to set up free. And if both of, our, if both of us play quiet, uh, we don't admit anything, then uh, actually the assumption here is that they can uh, send us to one year in prison or if you like four months in prison, some minor uh, punishment just because we hold, let's say, a rifle uh, in, in, without a license. So they can find something against us, a small one. So this is it. Now the story, by the way, the story in the books, when you read books about the prison's dilemma, the story is that they put them in different cells. So they cannot uh, coordinate, they cannot do anything. And then the question, what will happen as a result? And I say, you know what, these two guys were friends before. Why to put them in different cells? Put them in the same cell, okay? Let them talk to each other, coordinate. Except that, let's say at midnight, there are two buttons on the right of the cell and there are two buttons on the left of the cell. Of the cell. And at midnight, there is a gong, and I have to push a button, admit, or the other button, not admit. At the same time, you go to the other corner, and you have to push either one of the, the two buttons, admit or not admit. Okay, so now we find ourselves in the cell, and we talk to each other, and we coordinate what to do. So we look at it and say, look, quiet is if both of us are quiet, only one year in prison, why not? Okay, uh, by the way, the same would be one month in prison, if you like it better. Okay. Why, I, I'm very concerned, My, I really want to convince you to be quiet, why? If you are going not to testify against me and shut your mouth, then what can happen to me? If I admit, I go free. If I also quiet, I'm getting one year in prison. The worst case scenario for me, if you go quiet, is to serve one year in prison. Same for you. If I'm quiet, I'm player one, okay? If I'm, if I'm quiet, what can happen to you? You're here. Player two is always on the right. So uh, you can either go free if you admit, or you go to one year in prison if you're also quiet. 
So for you want me to be quiet, I want you to be quiet, okay? And so we're talking on in the, you know, sitting together in the cell, we'll say, let's be quiet, yes. Make sure you don't forget to push the quiet or not admit button. Yes, and you tell me and I tell you and we, you know, we sing it together, quiet, 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 wow. How nice it is, quiet, quiet. Gong, 12 midnight, and I go with no hesitations to my corner and I push, admit, and you go to your corner and push admit. And we serve 15 years in prison happily together. And we cannot avoid it. That's the point. Okay? So I want to I want to explain why this is the case. Okay. So I don't know what you do. Yeah, we, we shake hands, we shook hands, we, we, we talk to each other, we decide about quiet, but you can do either admit or being quiet. So I say to myself, suppose you cheated me and you're going to admit. What is, what, do I prefer 15 years in prison and, or life in prison? So this is, this is better outcome. If I, if I think you admit, then I should admit but maybe you're going to be quiet. If you are quiet, to be free with no criminal record is better than to spend one year in prison with a criminal record. So no matter what you decide to do, I hope you do quiet, but no matter what you decide to do, I'm better off admitting. Because five, 15 years is better than life in prison and free is better than one year in prison. Same for you. Let me erase it just to see it clearly what is for you. You don't know if I am going to admit or to be quiet, okay? So you say, if I am going to admit, should you admit or quiet? 15 or life in prison? 15. If you believe that I'm going to quiet, should you go free, no criminal record, or one year in prison with criminal record? Again, in both cases, want to be here and not here. Namely, you want to admit. So you admit, I admit. And as I say, both of us spent 15 years in prison. So here it is. A dominant strategy of each one of them is to admit. The only rational outcome is for them to spend 15 years in prison. What can we do? That's life. And uh, so that is the original prisoner's dilemma game. And this is obviously, so this is the outcome and obviously this is an inferior outcome. Why? They could spend one year, one year if they be both of them quiet. But if I believe you are quiet, I should admit. And you feel, if you believe that I'm quiet, okay, you should admit to go free. So it's impossible, two rational players will spend 15 years in prison. By the way, if I would be, if, let's say, that's as a, as a anecdote, okay? Suppose that I can push your button and you can push my button. Since I want you to be quiet, then I'll push obviously the button, your button quiet and you are going to push my button quiet and we'll spend one year in prison. The problem is that they, they don't allow us to, to push the buttons of the others. And therefore, it cost us, instead of one year, 15 years in prison. I hope that this example, let me tell you, as much as it looks uh, easy, it takes time to absorb it. It's not an easy example. Okay, to understand what is the dominant strategy and how to play it. So now I want to talk about a, what are games of the form that we can call them prisoner's dilemma games. By the way, all the previous games that I showed you were prisoner's dilemma games. So there are two conditions that must be satisfied before I can call it a prisoner's dilemma game. First, Every player is a strictly dominant strategy. Again, what is it? 
it means a strategy that is strictly better, more, more, strictly more, than any of the other strategies, irrespective of the choice of strategies of the other players. So I have a, a strictly dominant strategy, and you have. If only one of us, it's not a prisoner dilemma game. A prisoner dilemma game, first, each one of us must have a strictly dominant strategy. The other one is that when players choose their dominant strategy, and they should choose if they're rational, because this strategy is better for than any other strategy. Um, so when the player chooses the dominant strategies, the outcome is inferior. Namely, there is another outcome, at least one, that is strictly better for all players. So we will give you, here are examples. And before we go to the examples, I suggest to take a break. <laughs> 